Welcome to the Highway Church of Christ in Benton, Arkansas. Good to see all of you that are back for worship tonight. For those that may be visiting with us, we welcome you and hopefully that you'll be encouraged. Uh, it is a blessing to know that the congregation here is both increasing in number and growing. I use those two terms not to be synonymous. I use increasing in number for those that move to the area uh, that choose to associate themselves with the congregation. We're so grateful for your presence and it is an encouragement. But also know that the congregation is growing, that is to say, biblical growth, those that are being baptized into Christ, those that are being added to the Lord's church, that is the way biblical growth takes place. And we are experiencing both. And so we, for that, we can say to God be the glory. Amen. We can continue our work in demonstrating godliness in our community and also sharing the uh -huh. message of the gospel, my friends. That is the only way a person will come to obey the truth and be saved. Friendliness doesn't do it. Kindness doesn't do it. They help, but it doesn't do it. The only way the church grows biblically is by preaching that old time message. It is a saving message of the cross. If you have your New Testaments with you, I ask to, that you join me in the book of James, chapter 4. James, chapter 4. For those of us that are here, while you're turning there, I just want to frame our lesson tonight with this consideration. For those of us that are here tonight that are over, let's say, 65 years of age, some of us are many years beyond that, some of us are right around that. Let me ask you, doesn't it seem like only yesterday that you were maybe 20, or 12 even, or 5? I can imagine that on the one hand, it seemed like that was a lifetime ago, but really it seemed like just yesterday that maybe the children were still at home, or maybe you were just in grammar school, or you were learning to read or write or speak, and you can maybe remember your childhood as though it were yesterday. That's the same for each of us. My friends, James gives us a consideration in the book, uh, in chapter 4. Listen to what he says, beginning at verse 13. James 4, beginning at verse 13. It says, Go to now, and ye say that today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and, and get gain, whereas ye know not what ye shall do, or what shall be rather, on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. But that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, or do this, or that. But now ye rejoice in your boasting, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and do the not, to him that is sin. Our thought for tonight is the question, what is your life? Want to consider the gravity of life. While you're waiting for something to happen good, it can seem to take forever. When I was a little boy, it took 10 years for every birthday to come and sing. But as we get older, it seems like only 10 minutes before another birthday is coming, does it not? James describes that very phenomenon. Life is like a vapor. Those of us that were with us just yesterday are no longer with us. The wisdom that is shared in this book is both deep and rich. I would encourage each of us to read the book of James regularly. It's only five short chapters, and you can spend a few moments and just read one of those chapters each day. And I guarantee you, your life, both spiritually and otherwise, will be enriched. James helps us to consider the fact that time is precious and we ought to use it wisely. Through his writing, we're encouraged to view suffering uh, as a means to reach spiritual maturity as we read chapter 1. And James both reproves error uh, and he demonstrates showing respect of persons, uh, or we, that we should not rather demonstrate respect of persons. Uh, and later he lays out the true meaning and the demonstration of faith to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world in chapter 2. He also suggests that the practice or that patience, rather, is the key to contentment. And hope and prayer is the avenue through which we can access the power of God. There in 
chapter 5 of the book of James. But talk carefully there in between all those different chapters of great and rich wisdom. It's a jewel of immeasurable value. And that question that is related to us in the King James says, for what is your life? Uh, there are some things that we can, I think, examine or draw from this. And that's that we should examine ourselves daily. What is your life? What are we doing with the time that we have? There was one preacher that preached his sermon, what are we doing with the dash in between? And by that, he meant on the tombstones of most people, there is a date that we are born, there is a date that we leave this earth, but what do we do with that dash in between? And so from that, we might have a similar question for what is your life? We want to look at this from three basic uh, standpoints that we'll look at tonight. First, what is your life from the standpoint of duration? This is a multifaceted consideration if we think of the duration of our lives. It has to be understood that we only get one chance at life. There is no such thing as reincarnation as some religious groups would like us to believe. It's not the case that we can try to live as good as we want or as bad as we want because we'll get another try in the hereafter. <laughs> then we'll get another chance to come back again as maybe a different person or a bird or an insect and we can maybe try to get it right. Well, my friends, the Bible tells us very plainly that after death comes the judgment. There's a point to man, how many times to die? Two, three, four? Once to die for each of us. And so we don't get a second try at life. Second, our term of destiny is dependent upon the proper use of our time and our life here on earth. The way that we live dictates the way that we will leave this earth and spend eternity. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 reads, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to he had done, whether it be good or bad. Let us never be deceived, my friends. Never be deceived. That the way that you live does not play a role in your eternal fate. There are some that would say to us, it doesn't matter how you live. Oh, God loves you so much that you're just going to be saved no matter what. And on the other hand, there are some that are so dooming that they would say, it doesn't matter how you live, you're just going to be condemned or you'll just die and just turn into dust and that'll just be it for you. Neither of those things are true. The way that we live now dictates how we will spend our eternity. And Paul tells us as much in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Yes, Jesus did die for the entire world. John 3, 16 tells us that. But there is something that we must do while we're down here. Listen to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Paul writes, be not deceived. God is not mocked. You won't treat God. Says, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows the flesh and of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows the spirit and of the spirit reap eternal life. My friends, if you throw out tomato seeds, you're never going to get watermelons, cucumbers, squash, lettuce, or anything else. You'll only get that which you have already sown. If we sow to our flesh, God is not going to be tricked on the day of judgment. He won't say, oh, who are you again? I, I forget what you're doing. God knows the needs of every person. We will get exactly that which we have sown or that which is just and right to give us. The Bible makes it very clear that our eternal destiny is connected to the way that we spend our time here on earth. So again, the question for each of us is, well, what is your life in the way that you spend your time? Third, we have to plan to accomplish, uh, if we plan rather to accomplish anything in life, we have to stop procrastinating and get to it. I am by nature a procrastinator, and I'm telling you, I can procrastinate with the best of me. But if there's anything that I desire to accomplish, I have to just get off the stool, as they say, and do nothing, and get to it, and get it done. And the same is true for me, or you, or anyone else. If we want to accomplish anything, we have to do it. Listen to uh, the words of our Lord. He said himself, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work, John 9, 4. Jesus understood that there was a work of salvation that he needed to accomplish. And he couldn't just sit on the sidelines and hopefully mankind would be saved. Where would you and I be if Jesus said, well, I'll get to the cross one day. Well, I'll get to preaching the truth one day. We'd be doomed. 
The same is true for our souls, my friends. If we say, one day I'll get my life together, one day I'll give myself to Christ, one day I'll obey the gospel, let me tell you, friends, one day will never come. That's right. The only day that we have is today. That's the only day that's guaranteed to any of us. When either the trump of God will sound or our eyes close in eternal rest, it will be too late to do anything about our eternal condition. Just ask that old rich man that Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 16. Ask him if it's too late to go back. Ask him if he wishes he could have one more chance to go back and fix things. If he could just repent. If he could just do right. If he could just obey and listen to that sermon. I bet you he would do it. How many individuals leave this world daily? I used to remember the amount of people they say are estimated to die every single day. And all those individuals open up their eyes every day in eternity. Not able to change their faith. I wonder how many of those individuals who have been disobedient to the Lord could wish that they had done differently. And so for us that are still here, the question is asked for us, so what is your life? Is it worth it for us to live faithfully? My friends, life is brief. Listen to the way that these inspired writers talk about the brevity of life. James 4.14 says it's even a vapor that appears for a little time. We know what that is like. Whether you might draw from this a candle being blown out and smoke disappearing, or what James was probably more uh, likely referencing was morning fall. When the sun rises, it's gone. Never to be seen that day again. It's here momentarily, just gone. He talks about it in that terminology. Job says in Job 9, 25 and 26, he says, now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away. They are passed away as a swift ships, as the eagle that hastes to prey quickly. You ever seen an eagle dive down on its prey? Said, my days are just like that. As I started, just think about any of us, no matter what our age is, doesn't it seem like only yesterday we were doing this thing or that thing? Friends, life goes quickly. It's here for a moment and gone. Both James and Job compare the days of our lives to a flower that is cut away from the stem and soon withers. James does that in James chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. If you've ever bought fresh flowers, you buy them, and one day they're beautiful. It smells so wonderful, and you look up the next thing you know, and the petals have withered and fallen away. Quickly, time passes for all of us. These men understood that no matter how many grains of the sand pass through the hourglass of our lives, it is nothing when compared to eternity. We can live to be as old as we want to, and it will still be but a blip as it relates to eternity. Realizing that life is short for any of us, no matter if we live 10 years, 20 years, or 100 years, life is short. Let's consider our next thought. That is to say, what, our, what is our life? From a standpoint of purpose, what are we seeking to accomplish? Is there any spiritual value in that which we're doing? What is the purpose of our life? Life should be measured not necessarily in quantity of years, but the quality of time that we spend here. How do we impact other people? Have we helped to, to, to fill heaven? Have we helped to enrich the lives of the, of the individuals that are around us? Have I helped lead someone to Jesus Christ? Have I helped to encourage someone to make them more zealous for the cause of Christ? What is my life as it relates to purpose? The biography of the oldest man on record is given in just three verses. The oldest man that ever lived that we know of, at least, here is the biography of his entire life. It's written in Genesis chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. And it reads, And Methuselah lived 187 years and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived, after he begat Lamech, 780 and two years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. 969 years. Summed up just a few verses. He lived, had some kids, he died. On the contrary, Jesus our Lord lived on this earth approximately 33 years, but there are four books of biography about his life, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
But further, here's what John wrote about our Lord in his life. Talk about purpose and impact. Listen to what John wrote. In John 21, 25, he says, And there are also many of the things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Jesus' life was so impactful, his actions so many, that if we were to write down the world itself, this entire earth, not just Arkansas, not just the United States, not just this hemisphere, but the entire earth could not contain the books that are written based upon the impact that he made. So the question for us is, for what is your life as it relates to purpose? Mm -hmm. When you and I leave this world, will it simply be said, they lived, they died, now they're gone? Yes. Or will it be that someone will be able to say, this individual helped me to see Jesus more clearly? This individual helped me and encouraged me at a dark time in my life so I could stay the course. This person taught me the gospel. Will that be the story that is left behind for us? So many, uh, the purpose of life seems simply to eat, drink, and be merry. Just look around you at how many people live only to proverbially fill their bellies. What makes me happy? What makes me enjoy life? Not simply looking to make an impact, but just to enjoy life. The rich farmer of Luke chapter 15, he held this philosophy. If there was... No such thing as eternity and life on earth. Here was all that there had been and all that there ever would be. And this man didn't have a bad philosophy. If this was it for us, you just live here on earth and then after we die, that's just all. Then for him, that would be okay to just eat, drink, and be merry because there would be nothing else after that. But my friends, that's not the case. There's so many that live just like him and there's nothing after the grave. But Paul declared, if in this life we have hope in Christ or we have only hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If this, my friends, is it, then this is a miserable existence. To be around people that don't love their neighbors, to be around people that would just as soon as step on you and say hello to you, to be around people that would steal and curse and kill, to to have to say goodbye to loved ones, never to see them again. Could you imagine if this was it? No, my friends, we have a greater hope than not. We know that we're not like the beasts of the field or the things that creep and crawl on the earth. There is a tomorrow for us. There is an eternity for us. And God would have us to know better than that. And our purpose is not to accumulate material wealth. There are so many individuals that life is about more. It's about accumulating more, more wealth, more power, more land, more whatever it is, just more. But, but it's life simply about what we can accumulate and stuff into our homes. It's not. Listen to this. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Jesus wants us to know that it's not about what you own. As it's often been stated, we can carry nothing out of this world. There's nothing that you possess now that you can take with you. Just recently, I was in a, um, what is it, the Habitat for Humanity Restore uh, down in, in Bend. I like to collect books, and so I was looking for books. I saw this big box filled with comic books that were in pristine condition. Each one of them in a plastic sleeve, and, and it was numbered and, and, and dated and all of this. And it was amazing. The meticulous care that someone took to preserve these, and they probably, to that individual, they were probably of great value to them. You know how much those books were being sold for? A whopping 10 cents. That wouldn't even cover the cost of the paper, ink, and the plastic sleeve. 10 cents. Now ask that person who collected those books over however many years and spent however much time and however much money and however much effort to keep them in that pristine condition. Ask them now for what is your life. What does that time value them now in eternity? Can they say, well, my, my comic book collection was sure something else. What will that account for in eternity? Do you think God is going to be impressed with that comic book collection? I don't think that's going to come up in eternity unless it is because of covetousness or unless it is because of maybe misuse of finances. 
or misuse of time, but I don't guess that the Lord is going to be impressed with those things. Let's hear from the wise King Solomon as to the purpose of our lives. In Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is a whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Again, it's from Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Now, a study of that book of Ecclesiastes is very interesting, and if you have time, I would greatly encourage you to do so. It reveals that Solomon, in his great wisdom, power, reach because of wealth, was able to try just about everything there was to try in life. There was no no for him. Anything that he wanted, he had access to. He, he was able to do anything that he wanted to. And after he had tried these various things, after he looked for art, and he looked for wealth, and he looked for physical pleasure, all these different things, he came to a conclusion of it all. Now, here's a person that literally had access to anything that he wanted in the world. And after that individual saw whatever he wanted to see, here's his conclusion. It wasn't get rich and travel the world. Meet as many people as you want. Date as many people as you can. His conclusion was fear God and keep his commandments. He said, for this is the whole, the King James says the whole duty of man, but the original language says this is the whole of man. This is the essence of our existence. To fear God, that is to say, to reverence Him, to approach Him properly, and to obey what He says to do. My friends, that is the whole essence of man. The conclusion of reach came from extensive experience. In Mark chapter 8, verses 36 through 38, we find these words For which shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me, Jesus said, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and of his holy angels. Our purpose must be to show love and reverence to God through the keeping of his word, my friends. And so again, we can ask the question, well, what is your life? Material things are fine. I don't want to paint the picture that we should all be wearing potato sacks, living under the bridge somewhere. No. God has given us this amazing world and, and relationships and things to be able to enjoy. But none of those things should take priority. None of those things should come in the way of fearing God and keeping His commandments. They should not be the things that drive us, that compel us to open our eyes and live another day. It's serving the Lord. It's living for Jesus. So that in the end, we can live with Jesus. That's what it's all about, my friends. Having things is very nice. I enjoy having things. I enjoy taking trips and eating delicious food and, and sharing a fellowship with each of you. But none of those things, not one of those things is more important than my service to my king and my Lord. The same should be true for all of us. Amen. What is your life? from the standpoint of destiny. Now this question is inseparably connected to question number two. What is our life as it relates to purpose? What is your life from the standpoint of destiny? Our purpose directly affects our destiny. That which we do, what drives us, it will motivate us. That will dictate our eternity. The Bible clearly teaches that the destiny of some men will be According to Matthew chapter 7, destruction. Matthew 25, eternal punishment. Revelation 21, 8, a lake of fire and brimstone. But on the other hand, the Bible teaches that for others, their eternal fate, or their eternal destiny, rather, will be in Matthew 7, life. <coughs> Romans 6, 23, eternal life. Romans 2, verse 7, immortality with glory and honor. <coughs> the new Jerusalem. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. So if you were to just think of those few things, just those things that were listed, destruction, everlasting punishment, and the lake of fire and brimstone, that's on this side. That's option A. You can choose that. Option B on the other side would be life, eternal life, immortality, with glory and honor, and the new Jerusalem. Which one of those would you choose? We've all seen the game shows that say curtain A or curtain B. If you could see behind the curtains and it was life or destruction, heaven or hell, which would you choose? 
I believe any right thinking person would say, I'm going to go with curtain. <coughs> Is that evident by the way that we live? Because the way that we live makes that choice for us. It's not what I say with my lips, it's what I do in my life. That will dictate which curtain, if you will, we choose. So again, the question for each of us is, for what is your life? How are you using your time? Knowing that each moment, that each breath, each action, each thought helps to determine where we will spend eternity. For what is your life? It pays, my friends, to serve God. And I mean that in a literal and figurative sense. It benefits every single one of us to serve God. Amen. Serving God is not empty or vain. God allows us to have every spiritual blessing accessible according to Ephesians Chapter 1 and verse 3. Every spiritual blessing. He withholds nothing good from Christians. After many years of faithful service, here's what Paul came away with. After he had lived a life first being in opposition to the Christ and the church, he lived a life faithfully serving our Lord. Here is Paul's takeaway at the end of his life when he was prepared to die. In Rome, he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. If we could interview Paul, I would love to say, Paul, that crown of righteousness, how did that come about? Was it just because, you know, it fits your head, kind of like Cinderella's slipper? Is it because you, you paid for it? You had the right connections? How'd that crown of righteousness come to you, Paul? I think he might just repeat that which we just heard. Oh, because I fought a good fight. Because I finished my course. Because I kept the faith. That is the reason there was a crown of life, a crown of righteousness that was laid up for Paul. Each of us needs to be confronted with the question, what is your life? doesn't matter how old we are. In the parable of the laborers, we know that it doesn't matter uh, to at which time of our lives we come to know and obey Christ. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a young child or whether it's an adult. It, it does not matter. It's just how we spend that time in Christ. The main point is obey the gospel. Become a child of God. Be added to the kingdom of the church of our dear Lord. That's the main takeaway. It doesn't matter the duration of time. If a person is baptized into Christ, they come out of that water and seconds later they, they leave this earth for death. My friends, that person will go to the same heaven as the one that served our Lord faithfully for a hundred years. The duration of time doesn't matter, but the question for us is what is your life? We need to ask ourselves, what are we doing with life? What are we chasing? What is it that we love? What is our purpose? Knowing that our actions now will dictate our eternal destiny. Years will vanish away like a vapor. This year I turned 40. For some of you, that may seem old. For most of you, that seems not so old. But my friends, I remember being a little boy. When I see our little ones running around after worship, I remember being that little kid running under the pews, being told to slow down. I remember that like it was yesterday. And now, here I am. I'm sure that it'll seem like just a blink of an eye and many years will continue to pass by. Well, friends, the question for us again is, what is our life? I'd like to read a small poem as we conclude here. It's called Life's Clock. The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. To lose one's wealth is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more. To lose one's soul is such a loss, and no man can restore. The present only is our own. Live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in tomorrow, for the clock may then be still. My friends, tomorrow is not promised to each of us, or to any of us. The only time that we have is 
right now. Someone in this building who may not be a Christian or may be a far off from God because of a, a life lived in sin may be thinking one day I'm going to just get myself together and, and one day I'm going to obey God. One day I'm going to be a faithful child of God. One day. I wonder how many plots are filled in the cemetery with individuals who said or thought one day. One day. Wouldn't it be much better if we were sitting in our pews tonight and if we need to make that decision, instead of saying one day I'll do it, one day I'll obey the gospel, wouldn't it be good if we said today I'm going to obey the gospel? Today I'm going to repent. Today I'm choosing to live faithfully for the Lord so that if our Lord should come back today, we'll see him in peace. So that if our eyes do close in eternal sleep, we will see him in peace. Right. Friends, what is your life? If you know you need to respond to the Lord's gracious invitation, which says to any of us, come. Jesus simply asks that we hear the saving message that he is the Christ, that he is the king, that he is the only way to eternal life, that he is the, the advocate for every believer, we, we take that and we believe with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, so much so that we confess his name before other believers in the same way they did in the scriptures. If we would have the courage and the wherewithal to repent of our sin, that is to say, change our mind, which will result in the change of action. If we would submit ourselves to baptism, which according to Colossians, Chapter 2 is the operation of God, where God works on our souls. He cleanses us from all of our sin, and he places us into the church of his dear son. If we would but do that and remain faithful, we can be just like Paul and say, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which will never fade away. As we stand and sing this song of invitation, my friends, consider what is your life as we stand and sing. <laughs>